now my pleasure to introduce television writer turned author Maria Semple. Following a successful career writing for such television shows as Ellen, Mad About You, and Arrested Development, she penned her debut novel, the satirical This One Is Mine. Four years later, her international bestseller, Where'd You Go, Bernadette, spent well over a year on NPR's fiction bestseller list and was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction. Her new book, Today Will Be Different, follows a day in the life of a wife and mother forced to give up her small plans in lieu of an uncertain future. Author Lauren Groff, who visited the Free Library during our spring author events se season, hails, I had the uncanny feeling while reading that Maria Semple had somehow snuck into my house when I was asleep, took an x-ray image of my heart, then painted it by hand in neon colors. This, this book is searingly honest and hilarious and dark and neurotic. It is dizzying. Best of all, it is delicious. We're so pleased to have her here with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the terrific Maria Semple to the Free Library. So I was a TV writer for many years. I lived in Los Angeles and I wrote for a bunch of shows uh, that, that Alex told you about. And it was a really wonderful time of my life. And being in the writer's room, surrounded by um, black-hearted people who uh, uh, were trying to make you cry and didn't want the best for you, uh, really was wonderful. I loved, I loved the experience. Those are my people, I will say. So now nobody wants to be my friend, which is fine. Uh, but I was, I, I loved those, that time in the writer's room. It was the smartest people I knew, all trying to make each other laugh. And the hours were long and we bonded and I, I, I didn't even know that I had people um, until I moved to Seattle. Um, and realized that that's not what people in Seattle are like. But I've, I've jumped forward in, into the story. So, I, while I was working on TV shows, I never watched TV. I was a strange uh, sitcom writer in that I wouldn't go home and watch sitcoms. I would instead read books. And I w had very little patience it, going into work the next day. And people were saying, oh, they did this great thing on Frasier. Let's try to do something like they did on Frasier. Oh, we saw, oh, there was a wonderful Friends on last night, and we should do something like that. And that got me fighting mad, because I felt like, as writers, we should write about what happened to us and not filter it through a TV show and not feel like let's just combine two things that other people did and then call it original. And so I was always ended up coming in to work. Well, and this is about to not reflect well on my boyfriend, George. Um, but, but I would come in with funny fights. Of, uh, our, our, our nephew is in the audience, Charlie, so hello. So please, don't let this get back to him. Um, this is between us, okay, Charlie? So, uh, But so I would show up for work, and I would often recounts, recount funny arguments that I'd had with George, or you know, funny to maybe not so funny, but I would talk about it anyway. And, or I would tell a, just talk about things that would happen in my relationship, and often that was the basis of the shows. Then we would write shows about it. Luckily, George never, looked, uh, never watched sitcoms. So he still to this day doesn't know all the shows that have been based on him and his quirks uh, out there. And so um, while everyone was, was watching TV, I was reading books. And I was even trying to get book clubs started in a writer's room, which really was Sisyphusian and, and opened, uh, opened me up to total mockery. Uh, and, and, but that was really what I... I felt was up here, you know, writing novels was just this higher channel that I had no access to. Uh, and I loved writers, and I would try to, I'd go to author readings all the time, and I would read, I was really just trying to catch up on my classics, because I was an English major, so I was really mainly reading classics still at that point. And when my when my last show ended arrested development and i 
had befriended a guy named Bruce Wagner, who was an author, and I would always talk to him about writing and talk to him about books. And he said to me, you should write a novel. And I said, oh, I can't write a novel. Like, I'm an idiot, not me. I can't write a novel. And he said, look, novels are just your personality, and they're an expression of your interests. And you are really interesting, and you have a lot of interests, and you have an interest, you have a voice that I think is original, and, and I would read your novel. And that one little exchange was the most important uh, conversation I think I've had in, in my artistic life, in that it gave me permission to shift and think, wow, maybe I'm a novelist. What is keeping me from trying to write a novel? So I went home literally that night and started writing a novel. And all I wanted to do was write what I wanted to read. And I was terrified of bad writing, really, more than anything. That really was my impulse. And so you'll find in my first novel, uh, there are no similes or metaphors, because I would think that would make me, like, I didn't trust myself to write one, because I would think it would have to be bad, because I just didn't think of myself as a, as a, as a real writer. But I, I wrote this novel, and I sold it to Little Brown, and it was going to get published which was just a shock to me um, that that I was now a novelist. And so at that time, we decided to move to Seattle. And we had our daughter, and we thought we'd bring her up to Seattle and try a life outside of Los Angeles. And so it seemed like a good break to me that I would um, now be able to start a new chapter of my life in a new city and basically pick everything up where I left it off, that I would be able to just have all my friends and meet new people and just uh, maybe writers and moms, you know, because my daughter was just starting school and I heard that that's where you become friends with people is uh, it's in at the pick up, <laughs> pick up and drop off. And so, so when we got there, I was shocked at how different the culture was. And I will just say it how Seattle lacks all sense of humor. I can, right? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much on record as thinking that, so I'll just say it again. But I, I, moved, I moved up there, and I felt immediately alienated from just everybody who I came into contact with. And it was at the same time, again, that I was kind of thrust into this mom world, which I... I didn't understand what a huge trend, what a huge shift that is, is only interacting with people based on, on your kid, because I'd never had those relationships in my life, obviously. I was a TV writer, and that's how, in LA particularly, it's a company town, and you relate to people in terms of your career. And so I would show up, uh, I would drop my daughter off, and I would just start a normal conversation, and the mom would say, tell us what you really think. And I go, oh, what? I'm just making small talk. You know, I didn't know that it was what I was saying was so controversial. Or I would just start talking and they would say, it seems like someone needs to switch to decaf. <laughs> and I'd just say, like, hey, I'm just dropping my kid off. Like, I didn't understand. I felt, I felt, I, I, I will also add that they all had gray hair, which was a real shock coming from Los Angeles to see all these like women in their early 30s who are not attending to their roots. Um, <laughs> and so I felt I'd thrust into this world and I felt totally hated, but I hated them first, so I feel like they kind of can get a pass on that. And, uh, and at the same time, I my novel was coming out. Now, it, you know, it takes about a year for a novel to get published from when you sell it. So it was, it was coming out in December. We had moved there in September. And I thought, uh, okay, my book will come out and then I will be Ann Patchett. Um, <laughs> because I didn't know that you don't just become Ann Patchett if you write a book. I now know that. Uh, but at the time, it was just total ignorance about the way the the business worked, uh, where publishing worked, because where I came from in TV, you would be working on a show, and then you'd get a call saying, oh, the marketing crew is in, and they need to grab the actors, you know, for two hours, and the 
promo department, NBC would come in and there'd be 50 of them and there'd be a junket and then you'd watch Super Bowl the next, or you'd watch TV on Sunday and suddenly there are your actors in a funny promo for the, t for the football, you know, uh, game. And I just kind of assumed that this marketing on some level would kick in to books. You know, I thought there'd be some big marketing department and then I would be thrust into, you know, the platform of being a beloved novelist. Uh, so, so that didn't happen at all. My book totally bombed. And I think in, in four months, I sold 500 copies, 450 to my mother. Um, <laughs> And, and it was a, a total, um, I felt totally disgraced. I felt like a complete failure. And so I, I just kind of withdrew and acted like it didn't bother me, but I was just filled with self-pity and filled with just this t toxic hatred for an entire city of people I'd never met. Um, and I was talking to a friend of mine back home and I was saying, I'll never write again, and this is so, so um, painful, and I tried so hard, and I wanted to be a novelist, and I loved writing a novel, and I was so good at it, I thought, but now, you know, I've been rejected, my agent dropped me, I'll never write another book again, and all these moms in their comfort shoes who are so mean to me, and nobody wants to be my friend, and I was just going on and on, and my friend said, Maria, you're a writer, writers must write. If you do not write, you will become a menace to society. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, that's my book. It's me in 15 years if I don't write again. What does menace to society look like? And that was where you go, Bernadette. <laughs> and I wrote that novel. It was based on me and my feeling of being a failure as an artist and not being able to pick myself up. And, and what does menace to society look like 15 years from now to my boyfriend, George, to our daughter? And I just w went wild, you know, with, with the premise, basically. But it was very much rooted in something very painful. And so the, the book uh, obviously came out and did well and connected to people. And... In terms of, uh, another thing it did was solve my two big problems, which is that now I had a book that sold more than 500 copies, and people th in Seattle will now chew through mountains to become friends with me. Uh, and so now I don't have, I didn't have those two issues anymore, but I wanted to write my next book. And I knew that there was something that really worked for me about going to a place that was so painful a place that I didn't want anyone to see, that I felt I was, I, I had a lot of shame surrounding. And so I, w when it came time for me to work on my new book, and the book was a year and a half late the day that I started writing the book because I just didn't, I, I felt like, what do I have to complain about? You know, what possibly, what I have within me to write another book? Uh, and, and, and in fact, kind of knowing that, I'd made some attempts at some kind of very surface concepts for novels, but I would think of them and then just immediately lose interest and I wouldn't even finish an hour or two of writing, you know, just anything, you know, like a spot on the wall became more interesting than, than what I was writing because I just felt there was no truth to it, there was nothing personal about it, there was nothing that, that, that was special to me as a writer and about my experience. And more than anything, it was that there was nothing, they, I, there was no rich vein that I could tap into, because I really do believe that you need to tap into something that has a lot of energy within you, because you're gonna be in a room for about a year or two years writing a book that no one really wants to read particularly. I mean, even if you've had a, a, a a book that people like, you can't believe the forces of, <laughs> of um, um, entropy that just kind of um, uh, take over because you realize oh, the world does not need another book for me and that's like a very hard um, force to, to override. So that's why I think if there's something very deep inside you, it helps to tap into that. It can be your, your fuel. And so the first day 
of sitting and writing. I thought, I'm going to go down into my writing room, and I wake up at around 4.30 or 5, and I try to just go almost in a dreamlike state. This is how I start all my writing days, and I work on a yellow pad with pencils, and I try not to do computer and any of that stuff, at least in the beginning of the day. I try to just go and channel a deep something, almost like in in the sleep realm of of my mind. And so I thought, I'm going to go down to the room, and I'm just going to start writing, and it doesn't have to be part of my book. I just want to see if there's something inside me that I don't want the world to know about that I feel uh, really ashamed of. And so I wrote on a yellow pad, and I wrote what turned out to be the first page of my new novel, having no idea that that it would, would become the first page of my new novel. But I just wrote kind of, I closed my eyes and I'm gonna read to you what came out. This is essentially it. I've changed the names uh, to protect the innocent, but here's the first page of my novel. Today will be different. Today I will be present. Today anyone I'm speaking to, I will look them in the eye and listen deeply. Today I'll play a board game with Timby. I'll initiate sex with Joe. I know, ladies, that's funny, right? You're, okay, anyway. (laughs) Today, I will take pride in my appearance. I'll shower, get dressed in proper clothes, and only change into yoga clothes for yoga, which today I will actually attend. (laughs) Today, I won't swear. I won't talk about money. Today, there will be an ease about me. My face will be relaxed, its resting place a smile. Today I will radiate calm. Kindness and self-control will abound. Today I will buy local. Because I like to attack Amazon on the first page of all my novels. (laughs) Today I will be my best self, the person I'm capable of being. Today will be different. And thank you. And as soon as I wrote that, I realized that I was writing a novel that took place in a day about a woman who was disappointed in herself, about a woman who didn't love well the people she loved the most, and she knew it, and she was carrying the weight of that around her, uh, around with her. And the part of me, the comedy writer, that recognized that what I was going through with Where'd You Go, Bernadette, that was able to have a little bit of distance from my situation and was able to laugh at my situation. I also saw this first page, and regardless of how painful it was for me to look back on and see that that really was the state of my life, that I just wasn't present for my family, and uh, I I didn't, uh, you know, just... And Anne Lamott, do we know her? Anne Lamott, she's, yeah, she's, I'm sure she's spoken here. She's an incredible speaker. And I, I'm just going to totally tell you a little story about her that I thought was really sweet, that I met her for the first time in Denver about a month ago. And she was, we immediately kind of got into each other's business and we're just kind of oversharing and totally BFFs instantly. You know, I love her. She's so, she's like such a warm heart. And I told her that I, I'd uh, left my glasses in a taxi cab in New York uh, the, the day before, and I was really mad at myself because they were expensive glasses and it was a new prescription, and I was just like, just so mad at myself. And she said, Maria, you, do you have the receipt? And I said, yes. She said, you've got to call the number on the receipt because they, they can track down your glasses. And I was like, okay, okay. And she said, you're just saying that. You're not going to do it. I want you to promise me that you're going to do it because... I want you to care for yourself. And isn't that, that's heavy, right? And I just feel like she saw right into my heart, you know? And, and I think that's what the woman in this thing, I'm, I'm gonna get dressed, I'm gonna even bother to get dressed and try to look good. That's, I think, what Anne Lamott was talking about, was like, I want you to care for yourself. Now, I will say that the next day, I spent six hours on hold. <laughs> and I did not get my glasses back, so. I know. Thanks a lot, Anne Lamott. <laughs> some some new best friend you are, um, but but uh, 
but you know, I, I feel like that, you know, and I think people call it, it's, it's uh, you know, radical self-love or, you know, I think that's like a lot of people are kind of talking about that. And that's not at all where this book is coming from. <laughs> it's coming from someone who is not in the process of, of, uh, of practicing radical self-love. But, but, I, but I thought that that was, I thought that there was a comic premise to somebody basically having to try so hard even though she's setting the bar for herself so low that it is so hard she just has to repeat it over and over and over just to basic just to get through the day and just some basic level of um of dignity and so so that that's my book and it it does it takes place in a day in seattle we follow the life of eleanor flood she's married to a seahawks doctor named joe she has a son an eight-year-old boy named timby and who the first thing, of course, the day goes horribly awry. The first and to me worst thing that happens to her is right after she drops her kid off, about half an hour she gets a call from the school to come and get your kid because the kid is sick, which is like no phone call any mother wants uh, to get, especially when they thought they had the day to maybe do yoga and see your friends and stuff. So anyway, it starts off that way. And so she and Timby, Timby's tagging around, uh, tagging along with her all day. They're kind of a, I almost wrote it as, as a, as a road, road comedy where these two are kind of stuck with each other and they push each other's buttons and they're, and it's, they're very cute together. And the book, uh, it, it has a lot of narrative tricks the way that Where'd You Go Bernadette did. I really love writing that way. I love, I'm a restless reader and I will also think that I'm a restless writer as well that if I'm writing something and then suddenly I'll just there's just something inside me that wants to do a change up you know which is what where you go Bernadette really was a lot of the plot in that book was stuff that I didn't know I would be doing except I just thought oh I need to throw in something different here I need I'm getting bored and I need to take a left hand turn myself to keep it interesting so there's a so even though my book takes place in a day there's a lot of trickery that's going on which I know is a fun reading experience for um for for, for the reader and there's a graphic novel within the book there's a 12 page illustrated section which is really beautiful and little brown let me put in this cool uh graphic novel and the reason why I wanted to do that was because I I don't read a lot of nonfiction. I'm always just drifting towards fiction as a reader, but the, my favorite part about nonfiction is the picture section in the middle. And I love, you know, I love just trying to hold off looking at the pictures and then, oh, I can't say it, I have to look at the pictures. You know, who are these? Wait, who are these people? Oh, we'll find out who they are. And it's just all that kind of engagement, you know, in the pictures. And then you get there and you're like, oh, this is what those people look like. And, and then as you move past it, you're always looking back at the pictures. And I love just the, I'm a big fan I mean I'd even say I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of the physical book you know that's really I'm I'm not an e-reader I love the physical book I love carrying a book with me you you rarely will see me around town in Seattle without a book in my hand just because it just feels so good to hold a book I, I was talking to my friends at the library earlier and I was saying that we grew up in a small town in Aspen and in, in Colorado before it turned into this crazy a bunch of Russians and hedge fund people at when it was a cute little ski town and uh, and w the bus would drop us off at the library my father who was a real East Coast elite uh, really felt the gentleman belonged in libraries you know and would write he was a screenwriter he would write in his office in town and never miss a stop at the library on the way home and we would always be able to find him there you know I, I know what chair he was sitting in with his legs crossed reading the paper or having some books or some magazines and it was it was such an important part um, of of growing up and I feel like it was a real culture of our household was to go to the library and and, and an extension of that is the physical book. So I wanted to throw in something for the fiction reader that would replicate the fun of, of reading nonfiction in the pictures because also it's not just an illustrated section. It keeps morphing what it is. You, it's kind of presented as one thing and then it has, it's almost like an object that takes on a darker story of its own as you go along and so I, I have talked to people and it is what I was hoping for which is that people read it and keep looking back and go at oh, first I thought it was cute and now it's sad and now it's sweet again and so it kind of shifts on you the, the more of the story you read so 
I, uh, I think I'll take questions now um, because uh, I like answering questions. And uh, thank you for listening so far <laughs> this much. Hi. OK, Hi. good. Thank Why you. in the world did you move to Seattle, a place That's so, a, wait a minute, okay. so different from Los Angeles? Did mm. you do any dil due diligence and know what you were buying before you moved there? No, it was the stupidest thing that we could have done. I'll tell you what, so my boyfriend George is a TV writer. I was telling this to people at dinner. So, so here's the thing. He didn't want to have a kid or live in LA. And I, I've had to kind of make my pick of what it would be. And so I thought, okay, I'll get the kid and then we'll have to move somewhere. But I was able to just shine him on for about 15 years, you know, and not move anywhere. And then it was almost this weird game of chicken where he had gone to the, he'd gone to Seattle to go to the final four because he has friends and they go to the final four every year. And he went there and he said, oh, this is where I want to move. The way men might do when women who are more practical are like, wait, why would we move there of all places? But he was like, oh, I was up there for the final four and I loved it. And so we moved up. The, so, so anyway, in this weird game of chicken, he said, it's time for us to move. I was like, fine, we can move. He's like, you don't want to move. I was like, yeah, just tell me the city and we'll move there. He said, Seattle. I was like, fine, we'll move to Seattle. And now I'm stuck there. So, uh, so, so We'd had the kid. And so there was a logic to not raising a child in Los Angeles, right? Because that there is something to that. So we had the kid and we moved up there and to, to lest you think that I'm exaggerating how few people we knew up there, when I, uh, my daughter was going to the same school until fifth grade. And when we got her paperwork for fifth grade that I, they said look over it and update it left over from kindergarten is I was just looking and we, we had the same address, we had the same everything. And the in case of emergency person left over from kindergarten was our realtor. Yeah, and uh, thank God she didn't get the phone call because I don't know, my kid would not have uh, yes been picked up from the emergency room. So, uh, so yeah, we just it was just totally random. And and what's interesting is that is that so Bernadette was written out of something very personal and just so specific and private, you know. And I never expected it in in even my outside fantasizing that it would connect with as many people as, as it as it has. And I think that one of the things that happens when you write a book, which is really the thrill of being a published novelist, is that the book is something to you and then it turns into something to other people and you can just kind of go along for the ride, you know, and go, oh, I didn't know that. And what I did, there are many things about Bernadette I didn't realize I was writing. And one of them is the story of a transplant. And so many people from all over the country will say, I had that culture shock when I moved to Boston, or I'm from New York and I moved to Los Angeles. And that I think that that, in a way, is what I was tapping into. Was, or I, in, in my experience, there was, I was touching on a lot of common themes and frustrations. And, and I think that you, also, I, who, it's hard to move when you're 45 or whenever I moved. It was around then when I was 45. I was used to moving places when I was in my 20s where there's a culture of everyone like, yeah, let's get cheap Mexican tonight and margaritas. And you would, that was just part of the, your culture, you know? And then you're 45, you have a kid. And look, I'm now as bad as anyone in Seattle. If someone moves there, it's like, yeah, good luck. You know, like I just, I have my people, you know? And I'm now like one of these Seattle people who doesn't befriend other people. You know, once you have your people, I think when you're 50 or however old, it's just not welcoming. And I think because I had not moved anywhere since I was 20 on a very practical level, I just assumed when you move places, everyone was just gonna hang out with you every night of their lives, you know, and you just make all these friends, you know, and that just, it, it was just, it's just ignorance on top of ignorance on top of ignorance. I'll be the first to admit that. Yes. Hello, thank you for your talk. Thank you. Do you modify your talk when you deliver it to a Seattle audience? <laughs> or, or don't you talk in Seattle? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, okay, so here's what's weird, is that I, I don't really modify it in Seattle, just to make it exciting for me, at least, if no one else. Uh, and so, 
what's weird, well, so I'll tell you um, that when, so I wrote this book and I was, I'd written for Arrested Development and everybody loves Arrested Development, right? So I'm, I wrote the book and it was getting some buzz. And so I think it was right before the book came out, there was this big, like kind of shockingly big article about me in the New York Times. It must have been a slow news day, but it was like this huge thing on the cover of the art section of, and essentially it was Arrested Development writer comes and mocks everyone in Seattle, right? Moves to Seattle and then mocks everyone, right? Which I, I mean, I guess you take the press as long as they're spelling your name right, but I, I also didn't think that that was the book I was writing. That's another thing about, I'm writing about a transplant. I actually didn't know that I was writing a Seattle book. You know, when I was, I didn't know that it was so weird and mean about Seattle. I knew that my character Bernadette was weird and mean about Seattle, but I also knew that she loved Seattle at the end. And so that's really what I had my eye on of Seattle being kind of a device to express how messed up Bernadette was, right? I thought it was funny to blame all these people she doesn't know for her personal problems. And, and I was just using, trying to get the details right of that. But I really didn't think, okay, I'm page one. I'm going to just mock Seattle. Like I, that's so not what I thought was going on. So in my first reading at Elliott Bay Bookstore, I it was a packed house because of this, you know, article that had come out and everyone was emailing it to all their friends and oh, it was this person who comes, did you know her? You know, it says she lives in Seattle, you know, and every, it was a lot of buzz about this book. So in my first reading, I read the Seattle bashing section and, uh, well, you know, yeah, or a medium. I think I didn't go full on bashing Seattle, but it, but it's what it was, right? So I did maybe a half bashing Seattle, but everyone had read that New York Times piece. And so this was before I had adjusted to Seattle and, and before, and now I really truly like it there. But um, sh th this old lady, the first question of all, of my entire book tour of anything on my first day, she raised her hand. And I said, yes. And she said, I have a question. If you hate it here so much, why don't you just leave? <laughs> and and all, I was so shocked that I could just give her my honest answer, which was, because all my shit is here. Uh, and, and, and she laughed, and everyone laughed. And then afterwards, she then said, oh, honey, you can stay. You know, And she was very cute about me afterwards in the signing line. But, um, it, it's weird how Seattle loves the book, is all I will say, is it's really weird, and they kind of, and, and also another thing in my defense slightly is I think that living in any city is hating your city. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure all of you could go off on Philadelphia, you know, and the streets and whatever your issue is with Philadelphia. You know, I think if I said we're doing an exercise and you guys have to come in with a 10 minute chunk about what makes you crazy about Philadelphia, no one's going to be at a, I mean, the only problem will be to keep it down to 10 minutes, right? I mean, so, so I felt like what I was doing was kind of a normal thing. And, a tr and it, the truth is, I wrote about a lot of stuff that everyone thinks about Seattle. So the truth is, it's okay. Yes. No, I'm, I'm strangely have not been thrown out of that city yet. Yes. There's always time. Um, sitcom and comedy writing is so collaborative mm -hmm. and novel writing is so solitary. <laughs> was it yes. hard to make the transition? <laughs> I'm lonely. <laughs> it was... So I realized... Uh, that I am an introvert disguised as an extrovert. And I learned that when I was became a novelist, is that I think that I'm good in front of people and in groups of people, and I can definitely hold my own around a table of men who are comedy writers, which I think really... I, I don't know what it's like now. It's interesting. I've been out for a while, and there's been a, a lot of changes, and it was all white men and one white woman, you know, is what it was. And even to have the one white woman, that was really, you had to have a woman on staff. I was always the token woman, which, which didn't bother me. I was like, yay, I get to be, yay, get a job. I'm the token woman. I mean, thank God they needed a token woman, you know? So I, I felt like I was, so I was able to hold my own around the, the writer's table, you know? And it was fun for me and I liked it. I, it was totally awesome. And I felt like, 
if, if you're going on a funny run is what we used to call it, you know, if you're starting to pitch funny, crazy stuff, I can throw in some funny stuff too, you know, and that's what comedy writing is a lot. It's just kind of bouncing ideas off each other. You say something, I top it, you top it, I top it. And then you just start, uh, you know, saying a lot of crazy, funny stuff. And then you have to get back to work and write your script. But, uh, but so a lot of the funny stuff is really not the stuff even that you put in the script. It's just the being around the table. But, um, Th that I was good at, but I didn't understand how much it, how, how anxiety inducing it was for me. Cause that was kind of my resting state. It's a very intense job. And when I got to be, when I got to write alone in a room, I loved being in charge of my own time. I loved not having other people tell me what the boundaries were. I think that, you know, fiction, there's no boundaries. There's no rules. Every book you have to invent the book, you know, and that's one of the things that people don't tell you when you try to write a second book is that it's not like, oh, you wrote one book. Now you can go write your second book because you know how to write a book. You know, you don't know. You knew how to write your first book. It actually doesn't really help you with the second book, you know, or the third book or the fourth book. You don't kind of um, accumulate knowledge about how to write your books, which sounds strange, but you just have to trust me on that. I'm not being self-effacing. It really is true. And so when I was alone in a room, I liked having no rules. And I liked setting the rules myself, you know, that's to say that there's no rules, but then you have to figure out what your book is. You know, you have to make these choices about perspective, about how many characters, are these the right characters, when does it take place? You know, there's so many different um, decisions you have to make. I mean, talk about your brain being tired at the end of the day. I mean, I, I was reading somewhere that, that what tires your brain out is making decisions and that... I thought, oh gosh, I am making a thousand times more decisions in my job than other people are. I really believe that. I mean, I know I'm just standing here like a big victim, but I'm just telling you that that you are there and it's not just the language is the decision, but the story is the decision and what the internal logic of what you're writing is, it's all these decisions. And I enjoy that if I'm the one making those decisions. You get very resentful, I, I find. And which is really where a lot of the black, comedy and the bunker mentality comes from as a TV writer is that you're just constantly there's I mean budget issues everyone can realize because we're all adults you know but then it's a lot of just this capriciousness on the parts of actors or studio people or it's censors or it's so the actress is saying you know wait in the script it says that I think Los Angeles is the capital of California, and, and I don't think that. And you're like, yeah, I know you don't think that, but your character thinks that. Oh, no, but then people are going to think that I think that. No, they're not. They're going to think that you're, you know, and then it goes on and on, and then you're fired because you've said it one too many times. And so, uh, so you know, you're just getting, you're just exhausting your energy on these things that, that are not purely creative. And I love, I much prefer the novel writing because it's just pure creativity. And, and that said, it's much scarier because you're, I'm putting myself on the line. You know, I didn't, it, I worked on a ton of failed shows, but I never felt like I'm going out in the world as a failure. You were just one of a team of 300 people who crew people, I mean, everybody up and down, and you all did your best and it didn't work out, you know, and that, there's no shame in that in Hollywood. I'm just, you know, there isn't. For every fabulous writer, you know, um, there's a lot of terrible shows that they've worked on, you know, name me the writer and I'll tell you the crappy sitcom that they worked on, you know, and, and, uh, and so, th and that's fine, but it, it, and, and you, and you don't feel like it's you, but in, in novel writing, you feel like it's you. So the risk is greater, but I also think the reward creatively is much greater. I loved your book, Bernadette. And, Thank you. <laughs> and, um, I'm from Seattle. Mm. I grew for up for the record, her hair's not gray. <laughs> yeah. I grew up in a small town close to Seattle. Which one? Uh, Issaquah. Oh, I know Issaquah. Yeah. It was, there was I'm only one uh, blinking yeah. red light when I oh, lived really? there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I've been gone for, you know, 25, 30 years. And now I go back to Seattle and it just seems very changed to me. Um, but I, I was intrigued with the, uh, the theme of elitism mm. 
mm -hmm. um, in your book uh, versus uh, just loneliness. Like, mm -hmm. where is the difference there um, in terms of Bernadette's experience? So, so I define Bernadette by thinking she was better than other people. That, to me, was the character flaw that was going to be healed by the end of the book. You know, in the beginning of the book, she was from out of town. She was better than everybody. She mocked the way they looked. She mocked their provinciality. You know what I mean? That, to me, was something I really wrote right into very clearly. I was very aware of that. She doesn't like Canadians. You know, the reason why she doesn't like Canadians is everyone, they're nice, kind-hearted, and they treat everyone as equals, which to her is like the most threatening possible uh, thing that she can hear, you know, is that she, she has an ailment that she needs to be better than everybody and put everyone one down. And so I wrote right into that very specifically. And in fact, I didn't quite know how the book was going to end up, what kind of plot turns it would take. But I knew that the last word of the book would be mom. Because, and, and, and it's a letter to B where she says, and no, I'm always your comma mom. And it's, it, that to me was where I was aiming because it's because I think motherhood really does strip you of all individuality in a lot of ways you just become a mom you know and it's not that it was a terrible thing it's that she embraced it and that that's how she wanted to go through life now as being a mom she was friends with Audrey she's probably going to be friends with Sue Lin and it, it kind of leveled her out and so I think in in a very specific character way I was dealing with elitism and, and the ailment of it and how to cure it, you know, and I think Seattle was a good place for it because I, you know, it's one, it, it is provincial in the way, and I know Philadelphia is like this as well, but I know, for instance, that Aspen, Colorado, where I grew up, is like this that you're only as good as how long you've lived there, you know, and that everyone is one-upping you over, well, I've lived here longer. I, oh, you oh, you remember when it was Carl's? I remember when it was the Jerome. You're like, who cares? <laughs> Seriously, that's your currency, you idiots? But I feel like that there's so much of that in these places, you know, that, that they're really into one-upping you over that they've been here longer than you and you're the outsider. And so I felt like, you know, it's not just that, I felt like the other side was doing it to Bernadette too. You know what I mean? That that was there. And I, I do feel like that's provincial, you know, in, is provincial ever a good thing? I don't think so. So yeah, no, uh, yeah. Uh, but, but I feel like it, that's a, that's, that was my kind of criticism of them was that just because she was from somewhere else, they didn't like her. And the big fight after the mudslide, Audrey says to her, you know, I, in, from where we're standing, I grew up within, you know, within five miles is where I grew up. My mother grew up. My grandfather grew up, you know, and, and Bernadette just is like, what does this have to do with anything, you know? And so, and she, you know, so she doesn't play that game either. So I think I was trying to get to that. Would you mind talking about what it's like being on a book tour? Mm. Yes, yeah, so I love being on a book tour, I will say. That, that I think that, uh, I think it's part of the job. You know, I'm very clear about that. You hear a lot of people complain about it. And it, it certainly is different from writing alone in a room. You know, you can't believe how quickly you go from writing alone in a room to this other stuff, you know, and it just happens so suddenly and out of the blue that um, you just immediately long for the time when you were just not showering and not getting dressed out of yoga pants and, and being a writer. And so I think that uh, I feel like it's, it's a privilege to go and meet people and talk to them about your book. And it's really weird to talk about the book because it takes a while to learn how to talk about the book. That's what I find kind of interesting and that I never have anything prepared. You know, I, I just, I think maybe that's why it's so exhausting for me is I just kind of wing it, you know? And um, I think in a good way, it's not that I don't care. It's just that I actually, I think that's what keeps it interesting if you're loose. You know, I think if you're just doing the same prepared speech, I think that would be really soul numbing, you know? But it's fun, you know? It, it's you, you do events, it's a lot of, um, you know, it's airplane, it, it's like, like what part do you want to know about? Like I'm trying to think, because there's a lot to it and do you want to know just like about the, the, like what it's like to talk about your book or just physically going around? 
physically going around. Well, you get a town car, which is really awesome. I'll never go back to Uber, I'm just telling you. Like, once you have a Sonny's town car, Uber is like, yeah, for other people. Um, so, so that's a really bad thing, because I'm normally not on the town car tip. But you, uh, yeah, you lose a lot of toothbrushes and phone chargers and glasses, and you get to meet a lot of cool writers at festivals. And that's really fun. I'm a real kind of author stalker. And so every time I'm at a festival, I get really excited about who is going to be there, and I plan my schedule around who I can hit up. And a lot of times, I'll just email them out of the blue. And that's actually how I've made most of my friends is I've stalked them on um, on at festivals and and so I'm seeing some good writers uh, trying to think of my next I think the next uh, in in um in Austin I'm gonna be hanging out with Amor Tolls you know he is he wrote that gentleman in Moscow and I get to um, I'm having it's funny I said I'll have we'll have breakfast or lunch at 10 or 11. He said, well, you have lunch, I'll have breakfast. And we both realized we were too proud to write the word brunch. Um, uh, <laughs> so already I like him. Uh, and, so, um, and so I'm seeing him, Ben Fountain, who wrote Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, maybe my favorite book of the last 10 years. I already stalked him last tour into a friendship, and now he's like a genuine friend, so I get to see him. And so that's fun. I just think it's it's fun to meet the booksellers and the people, and you know, people want the best for you is the thing. You know, like that's why I don't get nervous, is because I think no one's coming here to wish me badly. You know, and I think that to me is what helps me. I feel like if it's a if it's a hostile crowd, I don't know that I'd be able to be loose and have fun. You know, I feel like I don't have to. It's not that I don't have to work that hard, but you don't have to work to try to get people to like you, you know, which to me is where anxiety comes in and that's where I go on the shame spirals for the days and days after, you know, because it just this awful thing clicks in and that's bad, you know, but I feel like my boyfriend says, think of it as a victory lap, you know, it's pure positive energy, you know, you're doing something positive, they're doing something positive and it, it's true. I haven't gotten sick yet. So that's good. And my friend Ann Patchett, who's now my friend, she was someone I'd had a wrong picture of, but she gave me this, like, a lot of supplements to take. So you don't get sick. And I'm on, the, I'm on it. So, so far, so good. I thank Ann Patchett for that. Thank you. So you talked a little bit about the, the mothering aspect and, and sort of being in, in that mode. Mm -hmm. I'm actually reading another book that has a similar theme, 40 Rooms. Um, and, I'm, and I'm wondering in real life then, so mm -hmm. um, how do you negotiate that? Because you are a mom and... Well, I actually think that other than this book tour where I'm not home, I think it's a good life. And I think that, I think that this is maybe not the PC thing or what people want to hear now, but I actually think it helps me being a mother. I mean, like, I actually think that what happens is that when I drop off, that's why I say, I mean, no one laughed when I said, oh, the worst thing that can happen is to have to pick your kid up from school. But as a writer, that's the worst thing that can happen because I have my window, you know, I'm writing from nine until three. And that's my time and I make really good use of it. You know, I, I do my early writing in the morning and then I, um, in the, on the notepad, then I make breakfast and for the family, then I do the drop off, I walk the dog, I'm a mom for a while, then I go back in and do all my Microsoft Word stuff and write up into, you know, write it up into a document and do my real kind of word processing writing. Then I'll go on a walk because I think that's an important part of writing is to just go on a walk and kind of let it all sink in a little bit. And then I'm a mom again. So in a way, I when I'm guilty, like right now, I mean, I'm guilty right now as I stand here because my daughter's having a volleyball tryout and I know she wants me to be there. And right when I get feel down about it, I think, you know, she gets an author for a mother. You know, she not that she wants to be hanging around with Amor Tolls, but, you know, the little bitch gets to hang out with Amor Tolls. You know, I'm just saying, you know, and, and if she's not going to be excited about it now, and she's there like, oh, is it over? But, you know, that's how I was. My father introduced me to a lot of really crazy, fabulous writers who meant nothing to me at the time, and I feel like that's who I am right now, is I was really molded by that. And I had the stink face, and I had the whole thing because I didn't want to listen to the adult conversation. But I, I actually think that it's okay. I feel good about it. 
it. I feel like what I'm offering her as a novelist. And also she sees what I go through. She saw when I was failed and when the manuscript of Where'd You Go, Bernadette, we were passed on by, I, I was passed on by 16 agents, you know, and she knew that. She was like, have you heard back from Julie Bear? Yeah, she passed. And she was like, I'm sorry, mama. You know, and I was really suffering. And now she sees that it's successful. And, you know, I, I try to be honest with her about it. And I, I've got to believe that that's a, a really cool thing for a kid to see the high and the lows of being an artist and putting yourself out there. So I, I feel okay about it, you know, and I think that she does get more of my time than most kids get with their moms because I'm able to use, work my schedule around my day. Hi, thank you so much. Um, in the book, Today Will Be Different, one of the main themes between uh, Eleanor and her husband is uh, their lack of faith and then at the end, um, the introduction of faith. Is yes. that actually about Christianity and religion, or is it more of a metaphor about belief? So there is a faith aspect to the new book. I don't know how many of you have read it, but I, uh, so when I was writing the first, when I wrote that first page, Today Will Be Different, and, I, and that book really gave me a strong concept of who Eleanor was. What I realized is she is a creature of self-will that every single thing that she goes for is she's trying to muscle her way through everything. That first page is about someone trying to muscle their way into something, you know, just trying to over and over and over force something. And as a writer, I feel like I have to rely on pure self-will to get my novels written. You know, you can't kind of turn it over to a higher power. That's not going to write your novel, you know, that's going to have me lying in bed watching MSNBC all day, you know, if I did that, and novels are not going to get written, you know, and so to me, there's something that, that I feel like I, I am a, a creature of self-will, and I think that every single thing that I have done that I'm proud of, I can say is a result of self-will. I also know that it's the worst thing in the world, according to religion, according to um, psychology, you know, it's turn it over to God. It's the higher power. It's the way in, in the Taoism, in Buddhism, it's non-attachment. You know, what I'm describing as self-will is according to the Buddha, the root of all man's suffering is the desire to have, want, want something to be the way that it's not right to, to, be attached to something that's not reality. And I've never understood what that, what you do with that information. Like on the one hand, I get that, okay, letting go is obviously a happier way to be. You see these people who are religious and who just don't sweat stuff. And I'm not so crazy that I don't get like, oh, they probably go through the day better than I do. They're probably loving people more and better than I am but I don't know how you're an artist and you let go. I still don't know, I will say. You know, so to me, the book, when I realized I was writing about self-will in the beginning of the book, I knew the book had to end with some version of God's will. You know what I mean? And again, it's, it's, it's the way that in Bernadette, I started with the individual and went to mom. You know, I knew it became very clear to me that had to be the trajectory of the book. And what form it took, I wasn't sure yet. I didn't know how explicit I would be about it or how metaphorical I would be. And so what I ended up with, I bet a lot of people haven't read the book, but what I, what I ended up with, when you read the book, you'll see the answer that I came up with. But I, I'd say I got into it much more from a character level and a kind of thematic level of what I was struggling with and where I thought the book was, just to sound pretentious for a second, telling me it needed to go. The way that Bernadette, I felt, needed to go from the individual to the society, in a way, you know, from... Um, I feel like this book needed to go from self-will to, you know, I say God's will. The book is a very atheistic book. It starts out that way, and you'll you'll see what I mean when you read the book. But but even even me saying the word God's will, you'll understand that I I'm not comfortable with that. But then you'll see what happens with the book. So yeah, so that that's very much what I was writing towards. That's where the arrow was pointing, and then how the book ends is how I how I resolved it. So thank you. I think we're done. Thank you, Philadelphia.